Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Breeze, Breezeway Productions' The Breeze, where we're excited to bring to you the latest in independent films that are currently out there hitting the viewership market. And uh, we have a wonderful film here today that we're going to talk about called The Judge, uh, Character, Cases, and Courage. And we're excited to have two wonderful guests here with us, Robert Griffith, director, and Al Calderero, executive producer. How are you doing, gentlemen? I think it's the greatest system in the world. I can't imagine doing anything else except being involved with the law. At the height of his judicial career, Robert R. Marriage Jr. was one of the most influential trial judges in the United States. After cleaning up his own docket, Judge Marriage traveled around the country ruling on landmark cases such as the Wounded Knee American Indian Movement Uprising. He presided over the trial of KKK members after a violent clash with the Communist Labor Party protesters in Greensboro, North Carolina, where no federal judge would hear the case. We are caught up in revolutionary struggle. Judge Marriage also ruled on the detention of radical civil rights leader H. Rapp Brown. And in 1970, he ordered the admission of women to the University of Virginia. Other nationally known cases on which he ruled included the Keepone chemical spill in Virginia's James River, one of the worst environmental disasters in the United States. He was able to settle the A.H. Robbins Dalcon Shield case, among the largest product liability cases in U.S. history at the time. And finally, in the early 1970s, he ruled on the desegregation of public schools in Richmond, Virginia, the former capital of the Confederacy. Influential, yet also controversial, he became the nation's go-to judge, selected to handle some of the most complex cases around the country. Great, how are you? Very good, very good. Thank you for, uh, for joining us today. And uh, tell me a little bit about The Judge. Al, you wanna talk about how it came about? Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I moved into an office uh, building uh, that was owned by the judge's son, and someone asked me why the judge had been famous, because in the 60s, I mean, in the 70s and 80s, primarily the judge was pretty well known in this, this area, actually, kind of, and nationally. So I told them what I knew, which got me interested in finding out more. Uh, the more I found out, the more interesting he became. Uh, he was just one of those people that, that appear in, in the course of history who just seemed to be in the middle of everything, all, all kinds of high profile events. Uh, somehow the judge wound up in the middle of them. Uh, and so he just, he seemed like a person that was worthy of a documentary. He was a stand up guy, believed in the law, believed in the constitution and uh, so at that point, I started looking around for a director. Uh, someone suggested I contact Bob, which I did. We talked about it. And you know, Bob's also from the Richmond area, knew about the judge. And after a conversation, we thought it was a good idea to do a documentary. And uh, that's how it started. Uh, it's about six years ago, but uh, that was wow. the beginning. Yeah, that's uh, a lot of work. Yeah, a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, when Al, Al, when Al uh, contacted me, I, I, my career started uh, professionally in, in television, working in film and news departments, documentary departments. So I was around doing uh, the judge's heyday, if you will. So I, rem I remembered a lot about these cases and him and his reputation. So when Al started talking about the possibility of trying to make a documentary, all that sort of, you know, came back very quickly. And uh, I definitely decided it was one that we could probably get funding for, which is always the catch. Yeah. So after uh, close to a year, we had enough to really roll. Yeah. Yeah. You had a lot of organizations that were a part of this film in order to, uh, to make it uh, a reality. Um, which of those organizations was the most integral? Uh, I know you used a lot of archival footage of the judge. You used a lot of newspaper clippings and things like that. Uh, which was the one that you'd say would be the, the strongest out of all of I, I, From my standpoint, all archival material that was made available to us, and that came from like what you just said, a variety of sources. Yeah. 
And without that archival material, it's kind of hard to make a documentary about someone that's not around anymore. Mm -hmm. So people really opened up once they heard about the film. I don't think we got no on hardly anything. And Al can address some of the people that we interviewed, but we were really digging deep, looking for material for from the research standpoint. So universities, uh, law firms, uh, federal courts opened up to us rummaging around looking for material. So yeah, there was a lot of a, a lot of help in that process. Sure. And uh, when when I saw Senator Kane came on to uh, to do some discussions about the judge, what, how was it like bringing uh, a senator onto this production and coordinating with their schedule? Since I can imagine that they're extremely busy doing what they're doing um, as a senator. Well, Senator Kane, uh, interestingly enough, is married to Ann Holton, who was a judge, uh, a clerk for the judge. Oh. So when they were, when they were engaged, the senator was clerking for a different a federal appeals court judge in Atlanta but he would come to Richmond on the weekends to visit Anne. And since the judge worked pretty much seven days a week, his clerks worked seven days a week. So in order for, for Senator Kane to see his future wife, he had to come to the judge's chambers. Oh, yeah. so, so the Senator became almost a surrogate clerk of the judges. And they remained friends uh, throughout the rest of the, the judge's life, uh, you know, and then very close because the judge was close to all his clerks. So that's, that was that story. So he was, he was ready and willing and able to, to be in the film. Nice. And he's very busy, his schedule's tight, but he made it work because he wanted to be in the film and wanted to talk about the judge. Yeah, yeah, I, I saw that. He really conveyed it. There was a lot of uh, illumination in his voice when he was uh, was talking about the judge. And then um, you went into some of the cases that he, he tried. He tried cases all over the country where they would call him in and they were looking for his decision on what a verdict would be. Uh, you know, there were civil rights cases. There was cases of uh, integration in schools. There was another case about uh, OSHA and then uh, birth control, all different kinds of things. So when you were picking which ones that you wanted to do, when you were laying out the, the, the course of the documentary, did you lay it out in such a way where you knew which cases you wanted to focus on first, second, third, fourth, et cetera? A lot of discussion about it because we, we definitely had a lot to pick from, but uh, the, the three that primarily ended up being focused on in the film mm -hmm. were very well known around the country and still are today. So once Al and I kind of went through the whole process uh, and he had over 500 cases come before his bench. So there was, there was a lot of material to go through. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we wanted to uh, pick the cases that still resonated today. And also the three that, that kind of demonstrated the essence of like who the judge was during his time on the bench, because there were many, many cases, and there are many, many high profile cases, but, you know, we're not making a 12 hour documentary, although we probably could have. <laughs> um, so we just try to, to, to pick the ones that showed who he was and, and, and again, resonated to, to this day. I mean, the, the women's rights in, in the Dow Khan Shield case, environmental uh, issues in the, in the Keepone case, and of course, um, integration and, and, social justice in, in the segregation cases. Yeah. But it was hard to pick. Yeah, it's there. You went through them all very uh, systematically so that I was able to see the wide range of cases that the judge would be trying and then his view on, you know, how he would come to a decision of what the verdict would be and what they would be charged. So I thought that that was well executed in that manner. Uh, there was there was one thing that happened with the judge where he made a, uh, a, a decision and then it was, had a lot of backlash and then they had to change it. And that some of the people that you were interviewing were saying that if this decision was kept, kept and stayed the way that it was, it would have changed the course of our country uh, indefinitely because of his decision being a little bit more progressive, I guess, so to say. Do you want to reflect on that? Yeah. I thought that was pretty wild. That was in schools. Yeah. Education. Yeah to be exact, yeah. Uh, our, uh, Rod Smoller made that statement towards the end of the film. Uh, he, was, he was sort of a thread throughout the film. He was a gentleman that kept appearing. Uh, he's, a, he's a legal scholar. And uh, he, he was uh, really in, in, in the loop from the, from the beginning of the film with Alan. 
Yeah. Yeah. The, I mean, the judge's, uh, you know, ruling in that case, as, as Rod says, would have changed the course of, of our history and, and we'd been in a much different place today. But, but it, it also was based on the, uh, his desire to, to do the right thing, to do the fair thing and, and to, uh, you know, bring justice to everyone that, that uh, you know, we all in this country should have equal opportunity. Uh, and obviously you can't guarantee the outcome, but everybody should have the same opportunity. So that just was typical of the judge. He wanted to do the right thing and the fair thing. And unfortunately the case got overturned uh, first by the court of appeals. And then it went to the Supreme court where the Supreme court tied uh, four to four. And when that happens, the, the decision reverts back to the appeals court case, which unfortunately overturned the judge's decision based on a very narrow kind of legal ruling uh, yeah. about crossing jurisdictional lines uh, from the city of Richmond to the counties of, of Henrico and, and Chesterfield. But the judge, again, as Rod Smola states, viewed it as a, not only just a, a Virginia problem, uh, but a national problem. So the jurisdictional lines were rather unimportant as far as the judge was concerned because it was a Virginia problem, not just a city of Richmond problem. Right. I, I think that the documentary was very thorough and it showed uh, a good history and precedent of, of cases that are still tried today in, uh, in some of those circumstances. And um, I, I'm sure most of you know about the current state of the judicial system and how much pressure that it's under for how decisions are made, most recently with what just happened with the George Floyd case, uh, which the whole world was watching. And it seems like there's more and more and more pressure on the judicial system. What I liked about the judge was that he wanted to get done efficiently and quickly and move things along, as you said, so that it wasn't drawn out for a million years. But I wanted your, ta your, your take on how the judicial system is today. And do you think that there could be a judge like this one and that the pressure is really on their shoulders for making these verdicts uh, really it can impact the world? So what are your thoughts? On I, I think that, that there's a, a slow arc, uh, arcing back, if you will, uh, to the rule of law. I think it's very slow, but I think some of the events that just occurred and, and that are gonna be occurring, uh, I think people have been sitting on the fence that have been really apprehensive about doing their job might really rethink how they go about it now, which is a healthy thing. And I don't think it will be fast. I think, as a matter of fact, I think it'd be very slow, but better to have it going in the right direction uh, as a consequence of all the things that we've all gone through for four years and just recently. That's my personal take on it. And, and I sure hope that is what's gonna happen. Yeah. Well, I, I think that, uh, you know, over the last several months with the controversy over the election and those cases, there, there were judges who, who demonstrated <laughs> their ability to, to uh, go with the rule of law as opposed to, uh, uh, you know, knuckling under to the, to the pressure. I mean, certainly none of them was under any more pressure than the judge, judge marriage was. But I think that, that uh, surprisingly to some people, uh, even, even appointees of the former president uh, stepped up and ruled against him because uh, they, were, they were upholding the law. They were going with the rule of the law, the uh, rule of law as opposed to rule of men which what the judge certainly stood for. So I, I think that, you know, there are many judges who would step up given the opportunity or given the necessity. Uh, and we found that when we were interviewing judges that, uh, that, I mean, these are people for the most part that really believe in the constitution and really believe in the rule of law. So I think it was good because it, got, it gave them the opportunity to step up and, and demonstrate how important the rule of law is. And, so it's like Bob says, now that the arc is moving in that direction and uh, people are starting to sort of rediscover their dedication to the constitution. That, that, that's my hope, uh, we'll see. But Yeah, do their jobs efficiently. Effectively. Well, you've got Garland now, you knew our new attorney general. And uh, just, I believe it was this morning, late yesterday, he's launching an investigation more into the Floyd 
case, uh, the broad stroke of the, the police department. Uh, and so I think him stepping up so quickly is another good indicator of people uh, getting on board with getting back to the basics and, and paying attention to the law and the constitution. It's, it's kind of, I think it's going to be uh, popular now <laughs> with certain people. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we can all look forward to that, where uh, where the rule of law is upheld just justly, and that the the correct verdicts are chosen after um, you know a fair yeah. trial is held, because everyone is uh, innocent until proven guilty. I believe is what it is said, and let's hope that that's reinforced. Yeah. Well, um, he too, you got to remember that he came that? to Virginia. He came to Richmond, Virginia, the former capital of the Confederacy, and he was from New York. So there was a lot going on there. I think when he landed as a federal judge. Yeah, definitely a, a totally different culture shift. Uh, I'm yeah. in New York right now personally, so I know going yeah. into the South and I've, I've been, it's definitely two completely different worlds. And like the same thing with East and West Coast. It's just yeah, adapting to the culture and learning how, how it works in that area. Um, okay, so the judge, uh, where can people go to find out more about it? And uh, is the website that they can go to and where can they expect it to be released? Or are you? Um, what's the story with, uh, no. with where the judge is? Yeah. Yeah, we have a website, uh, thejudgedocumentary.com, that's dedicated to the film. Uh, the I, I mean, it's it's available now on pay per view, Amazon Prime, Apple TV, number of other, which we're all listed on the website. And also uh, next week or the first week in May, I believe, uh, it'll be available for streaming on on uh, Tubi, and. Uh, probably some other uh, uh, AVODs that we're not aware of yet because we haven't gotten the, the, the final rundown, but we know it's going to be on Tubi. That's great. Hey, a lot of outlets, more more ways that people can go and watch the film, which is great. And we're going to be uh, advocating for that. And lower thirds on the bottom, we'll have the link to the uh, the website and other places where they can find it. So I wanted to thank you, gentlemen, for for joining me today uh, to talk about the film. And uh, I appreciate you spending the time to to talk about the judge. So um, I want you all to take care and thank every all the viewers for watching the breeze. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you.